Good morning. Good morning, family. Now, I'm from the Talk Back Church. So it's okay to talk back to me. Good morning, family. To Dr. Campbell, our president, for her leadership and steadfastness over these many years. We wish her well and God's blessings as she goes to the next segment of her journey. To Reverend Dr. Michelle Guidry, the Dean of Sisters Chapel, our platform guests, faculty, trustees. To my baby sister, the Reverend Dr. Dornique Daughtry, I don't know where she is. She came with me from New York today. And of course, to the graduates. I counted a high honor to be with you today and to share some words with you as you prepare to journey to your next life. As I prepared today, I found myself enamored with your motto, a choice to change the world. That is a sermon unto itself, a choice to change the world. The question is, when you leave the protected, nurtured, hallowed halls of this venerated place, how do you live this motto? How do you actually change the world? Allow me to ponder that with you today. I want to start, if I may, with a moment of transparency. Just a little something personal that I want to share just between me and you. And it is this. My name is Leah, and I am a stroller. S-T-R-O-W-E-R, -E I am a stroller. At least that's what my mom has at times called me. Some of those times affectionately. Leah is a stroller. By that she means and she meant my ability, my talent, my gift really, to go into a room, any room, and completely take it over with my things. A scarf here, a book there, a shoe over here, some papers on the table, my purse on the couch, because all I need is 10 minutes, <laughs> maybe just five, to make a room, an office, a conference table my own. Do I have any strollers in the house? <laughs> Leah is a stroller. That's what my mom and my sisters say. The men in the family know better than to come in. What my sisters and my mom mean is messy and disorganized. And when I was younger, less secure, less grown, less womanish, their words stung and I responded by trying to make myself smaller, by trying to fit myself into their definition of what my living should look like. But now, fully grown, Fully woman, when my mom and my sister say that I'm a stroller, I accept it. In fact, I claim it as one of my superpowers. This ability, this skill, this gift I have to take up space. Because that's really what it is, whether it's my stuff or my opinions or my presence, it's the way that I make myself known, that I make room for myself, that I let others know that I am here, and that my presence, my spirit, my breath, my being, my life requires a certain amount of space. This brings me to my subject for today and the question that I want to ask, sister. Let me ask you, are you taking up space? Let's go to the text because I'm a preacher and that's my task. In the book of Numbers chapter 27, starting at verse 1, then came the daughters of Zelophehad, 
son of Hefer, son of Gilead, son of Mahir, son of Manasseh, of the family of Manasseh, son of Joseph. Their names were Mala, Noah, Hagla, Milha, and Tirzah. They stood before Moses, Eleazar, the priest, and the leaders, and all the congregation at the door of the tent of meeting. And they said, our father died in the wilderness. He was not among those who assembled in rebellion, but he died for his own sins, and he had no sons. Why should the name of our father be removed from his family because he had no son? Give to us a possession among our father's brethren. And Moses brought their case before the Lord, and the Lord said to Moses, The daughters of Zelophehad have spoken rightly. You shall surely give them an inheritance among their father's brethren, and you shall cause their father's inheritance to pass to them. And say to the nation, if a man dies and has no son, you shall cause his inheritance to pass to his daughter. As we come to our text today, we find Moses and others gathered at the tent of meeting. The tent of meeting is where Moses would meet God and where the congregation would go to inquire of the Lord. If you wanted an answer from God, you would present yourself at the tent of meeting. Now, women were not allowed inside the tent of meeting. They could only go so far as the outer door. And if they wanted an answer from the Lord, they would go to the door and share their petition there. So on this particular day, Moses was about to share the guidance on inheritance, how the people were to ensure that the land that God had given them would remain in their possession. Everything was going according to plan. Then came the daughters of Zelophehad. It was an uh-oh moment. You can almost feel the eyebrows going up. You may almost hear the whispering, what are they doing here? Here they come. What do they want? Now, if I were to hazard a guess, I would say that Zelophehad's daughters had a bit of a reputation for being bold, for talking out of turn, for speaking their minds, for taking up causes, for challenging the way things were. Anybody know anybody like that? So true to form, here they were, unbossed, unbought, brazen and bold, and they took their petition to the tent of meeting directly to the leader. Sir, 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 these rules, these rules you got set up here is a problem. We got to talk about this because we are being cut out of the inheritance. Sir, we have to talk. Now, what I appreciate about Moses is that all his experience, all his home training is on full display that day. Maybe he remembered his own mother's brazenness and keeping him hidden from the sword of Pharaoh. Maybe he remembered the midwife's bravery in pulling him out of the bulrushes and hiding him. Or the boldness of his sister Miriam, who exampled how to pray and how to proclaim victory and who had a whole lot to say herself. And his wife, Zipporah, was one of six sisters. Moses was used to strong women. So when Milcha and her sisters came to the door of the tent of meeting with something to say, maybe he recognized them, if not by name and face, then by posture and purpose. So he didn't reject them. He listened and he took their concerns to God. And God, our God, the Most High God, declared that they were right, and the laws of the nation changed that day. Noah and her sisters decided that the boundaries into which the laws of their people had drawn them were too confining, that the place they had been assigned was too small, that the space they were relegated to was not enough they decided that their lives, their voices, their beings needed and deserved more space. So sister, let me ask you, are you taking up space? We are living in treacherous times. All around us, we see a nation at a crossroads, imploding under the weight of its own dichotomies and contradictions. 
Unemployment is the lowest it's ever been, which means near everybody is working. Rages are rising, but so is crime. Price gouging by oil companies has us paying astronomical rates for gas. Factory closures and supply chain interruptions have people scrambling for basics like baby formula. But last week, the world's richest man bought a social media platform, and his first act was to declare, under the guise of free speech, that he would reinstate the account of a notorious, dangerous, and proven liar. That's what he said. Across the water, a dictator has decided to undertake a brazen land grab. And in our own country, some political forces are in a land grab of their own, as they boldly institute measures to disenfranchise voters to steal elections that they cannot win outright. Our very democracy is in peril. We have watched the most qualified nominee in the history of Supreme Court nominees endure a brutal and demeaning hearing process in which every single one of her attackers stated that she was qualified for the job. Where one senator in the most blatantly political statement I have heard said outright that if his party was in power, this qualified woman would never get a hearing. That's what he said, but thank God those senators didn't have the last word. And thank God that soon and very soon, Judge Jackson will become Justice Jackson. Yeah. And right this very minute, we are in a battle to protect and defend our basic human rights including the right to make our own decisions about our bodies and our health care. Make no mistake, the overturning of Roe v. Wade is not about a medical procedure. It is about power. It is about the power to decide. It is about the power to decide who decides. It's about who's important and who is not whose opinion is important and who is not. And at base, it's about a patriarchal system that has decided that you, whom they've deemed to be a lesser being, that you are not smart enough, wise enough, human enough, or made in the image of God enough to make decisions about your own self. Now, as a black woman directly descended from enslaved people, I remember on a deep cellular level a time when we were not in control of our own bodies or our own lives, when the slave master determined what we ate, what we wore, where we lived, who we married, if we married, and whether we would have children, and they even named the children they gave us permission to have. My ancestors rise up in me now when they say, daughter, don't you let them take you back. Daughter, we did not endure and struggle and fight and breathe so that you could return to 1850. Daughter, you cannot let them take you back. For the same demonic powers that ignored our humanity and bondage are the same huma demonic powers that ignored her, your humanity and freedom. Daughter, you have to take a stand. If you can't stand for yourself, stand for us. If you can't speak for yourself, speak for us. Fight for us. Represent us. Hold space for us. Take up space for us. Sister, let me ask you, are you taking up space? By now you know I don't necessarily mean the physical sense of space, but really in the figurative sense of acknowledging, creating, and requiring the space you need to be fully, wholly, and freely you. Yeah. The you that God designed, 
the you that God created, the you of unlimited imagination and boundless energy, the you that can fly. Claiming space is both a revolutionary act and a spiritual act. Revolutionary because it runs counter to the oppressive systems of this world. The patriarchy that seeks daily to diminish and demean and dismiss us. These systems depend on you playing small. They depend on you staying confined and bound. Because they know that a free people is a dangerous people. And that's why they work so hard to keep you bound and confined to the smallness to small thinking and small dreaming and small building. Claiming space is a spiritual act. Because the truth of the matter is that you are God designed to take up space. You have gifts and talents and wonders that are uniquely yours, the spaces that only you can fill. No one can do what you do like you do. But let me give you a caution, taking up your space does not necess necessitate taking up someone else's space. There is enough heaven and God's sky for each of us, all of us to shine. But the constellation is incomplete unless each star is shining. Each one is given a gift to use it for the common good system. Let me ask you, are you taking up all of your space? Even among those of us who live out loud and who have found, as Dr. Katie Geneva Cannon would say, the work our souls must have, there is, I believe, unrealized and unexplored space, a part of ourselves that we have not tapped into or fully explored yet. There is space that we must claim externally, of course, among friends, colleagues, lovers, and family. But there is also space that we must claim internally, in our inner life, in our spirit life, in our thought life. And leaving this space unexplored and unclaimed and untested is like leaving a room in your house closed off, unfurnished, unutilized, just vacant and blank, full of potential, but nothing's happening. The challenges we face in this world are societal, political, cultural, and perhaps even personal. And yet, despite the towering challenges, the large odds, you have made a choice to change the world. But what happens when you leave the sacred, nurturing, protective halls of Spelman College? How shall you change the world? Let's go back to Hagla and her sisters. The inheritance was there. God had said, was theirs. God had said so. Moses said so. The laws were changed. A promise was made. The inheritance they dared to demand was theirs. You know they went back to their tents, dancing and rejoicing in their triumph. And they waited for the land to be assigned to them. And they waited, and they waited, and they waited. The people who had been there that day died off and they waited. Moses died and they waited. The nation fought battles and wars and they waited. The nation enlarged its territory and expanded its borders and they waited. So when Joshua started apportioning the land, they must have thought our wait is over. It's time, now is our time. Now the promise will be fulfilled. And they waited for someone to knock on the door. They waited for someone to call their name, and they waited, and they waited, and they waited, and they waited. And finally, I imagine they got tired of waiting, tired of helping somebody else pack up, tired of watching everybody else get their blessing and move into their land, tired of waiting for their names to be called, tired of being overlooked, tired of being demeaned, tired of being dismissed, tired of being told to wait, tired of being told not to be tired, 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 sick and tired. And I imagine the day came when they were sick and tired of being sick and tired and they remembered their strength. They remembered their boldness. They remembered their heart. They remembered who they were. And the text says that they got up and went back to Eleazar the priest and to Joshua the leader and said, Sir, Sir. 
sir, where is my lamb? Where is the fulfillment of the promise that God made to me? And so Joshua, he didn't even bother to argue. The Bible just says Joshua gave them an inheritance with the brothers of their fathers as the Lord had commanded. Now you see, sister, sometimes we believe in a promise. We wait on a promise and that's what we do is wait. We wait for the job. We wait for the phone call. We wait for the blessing to come to us because God said it, I believe it, and that settles it. Well, let me tell you something. The decreeing of a thing and the declaring of a thing is not the same as the doing of a thing. Sometimes, most times, seeing the manifestation of your dreams requires action on your part. Freedom is never free. It costs, and you have to invest. You have to insist. You're going to have to demand. You're going to have to work. So how will you change the world? By refusing to be invisible, by refusing to be silent, by claiming your space, by taking up space. But sister, when you take up space, when you speak in your space, when you stand in your space, recognize that you take up space not only for yourself. Dr. Angelou said, I come as one, but I stand as 10,000. So remember that you stand in the gap for those who haven't yet found their space or their voice and for the sisters who could not be here. We hold space for Sandra Bland and Brianna Taylor. We hold space for Rakia Boyd. We hold space for Dana Martin and Nina Pop. We're here for the sisters who take the early bus. We're here for the sisters who work the late shift. We're here for the sisters who have more months than money. We're here for the sisters who just trying to make a way. We're here for her, our aunties and our mamas and our grandmamas and our daddies who sacrificed their dreams for ours. We are here and we have made the choice to change the world. We're at a critical juncture in our nation, the curious intersection of hopelessness and hopefulness, and we must decide the path that we will choose. We are blessed to live in this time. We are blessed to be able to make change. We are all across this nation. We see change on the horizon, and so we stand firm with our faces set, our minds made up, and our hearts determined to claim our space and change our world. We rise to meet the moments. Let us bravely greet the day for all of Zalofahad's daughters. Whether your name is Milka or Zilha or Hogla or Noah or Mala or maybe your name is Betty or Bryce or Zakia or Gabrielle. For Tamika, Latoya, Gwendolyn and Sarah Jane, take up your space. Take all of your space with your faces to the future with your fists raised higher than hope, with the thunder of feet marching, with the pounder of, pounding of hearts rebelling, the wind of voices rushing, the crash of statues falling, the power of ballots dropping, no longer delayed, no longer denied. We may be troubled on every side, but we are not distressed. We are perplexed but we're not in despair. We're persecuted, but we're not forsaken. We're cast down, but we're not destroyed. As we fight for freedom and self-determination for our people, as we battle seemingly insurmountable odds to bring change to this country, let's hold on to hope. Let's remember to hope. Let us remind ourselves that there is hope as the people of God, by whatever name you call him or her. Our hope is belief in the face of seemingly impossible odds. Our hope is believing despite the odds. Our hope exists regardless of possibility or impossibility. Our hope is a form of resistance. Our hope comes from the eternal source, the creator of life and the giver of space. So claim your space and all that it requires. Claim it. Take it, assume it, presume it, take up space. Take up your space. Open the doors to your imagination. Let fly the windows of your soul. Write the book, score the film, cook the feast, paint the canvas, quilt the blanket.
jacket, join the movement, start a movement, knit the sweater, preach the sermon, sing the song and sing it loudly, shine and shine brightly, fill every room in your house. The God of our creation has already prepared it. The lover of our souls is waiting for you to take up space.